Our oceans are not only an incredible source of inspiration and beauty, but are also of unbelievable economic value. Globally, an estimated half a billion people rely on coral reefs as a source of food, as protection from storms, and as a source of income. After decades of overfishing, the coastal waters of Jamaica have begun to run out of an essential resource, fish. The Alligator Head Foundation have worked to set up a new network of marine protected areas. And for their work to recover fish populations to be successful, they need the local community and fishermen on board. I met with Dr. Dane Budo to better understand the work that goes into creating an MPA and how you can convert a community that is so reliant on its coastline as a source of food and income to a sustainable livelihood. Right now, the fish sanctuary is only covered less than 2% of the entire marine space. So if you think about all of that, the entire marine space of Jamaica that's being fished, only 2% is actually producing the fish. So we'd love to see that number go to 20% over time so that you can have more sustainability of the fish stocks. You can then you know, breathe a little easier knowing that this, the resource can support the livelihoods. The center of the industry, the fishing industry, is the resource. So we have to protect that. Everything else comes after. There has to be fish before you are fishermen. This is the only thing that's working right now, these fish sanctuaries. So how does that work? How does a fish sanctuary recover these fish populations? Fish sanctuaries, by the legal definition of it, it's a zero take zone. So it's an area that is used to replenish fish stock. You leave it be, you do restoration activities at the same time, remove threats such as fishing, etc., and hopefully it will bounce back because you're now creating the habitat and the opportunity for them to bounce back. Do you think this is going to be a fish sanctuary forever or what's the long-term goal? Do you think there'll be a point where you can move it past being a complete no-take zone? If this is an area that's going to replenish fish stocks in perpetuity, I would like to keep it like this. If we could have rolled back time 40 years ago when fish stocks were great and we could have cordoned off an area to just safeguard that, those fish stocks, that would be the easiest thing to do. So I would say keep it and we can have fish all the time outside of these areas. One of the problems that we see around the world of marine protected areas is the policing of them. And there are a lot of places they put these policies in place, but then unless there's someone out there actually enforcing them, they're not having an impact. How do you go about managing this area? Well, this area, you know, it's six square kilometers, but it's right on the coastline. So you, you can access it. Persons can access it by just walking through and swimming out into the sanctuary. So if you think about all of these vantage points that they can just simply walk into the sanctuary and go and shoot fish, um, it's a big task. So we have a, a, sea, a set of wardens, we have our boats, we have partnership with the marine police, the coast guard, the local police. We couple that with public education and community outreach and alternative livelihood programs. The foundation as well has actually trained fishermen to become wardens. How did you manage to get all the fishermen to come on board with this huge project? Because it must impact the local people and their normal livelihoods. How did you manage to work with them to make it a success all round? A fish sanctuary is a no-take zone. So if persons are accustomed to going to sea and fishing in this area, they can no longer do this. They have to go elsewhere. They have to go either further or towards, this, towards you know, the east and west of the sanctuary. Right now, you know, after showing some progress, the community is more behind us. You know, before it was all promises. If you do this, if you give this up, the fish will come back and we'll plant corals and we'll plant mangroves and help them to come back even faster. But it's all a promise. It's a calculated promise, yes. And it's based on science, and, but it's never 100% sure. And I'm asking you to give up your livelihood for something that's not 100% sure. I'm asking you to give me the opportunity to safeguard your livelihood. And that's the angle that we took. They wanted to fish. They wanted the children to fish in perpetuity. So giving them that opportunity to develop their livelihoods was one of the ways we actually looked at it. Increasing the other things that they want to do. Some of them wanted to be carpenters and some of them wanted to become lifeguards and tour guides and other things other than fishing. We started programs where those things are concerned. So that helped with the conflict resolution because there was a lot of promise and a lot of skepticism all at the same time. 
What is the biggest change you personally have seen when you're out there, when you're in the water and diving? What have you seen that's made you go, yes, this is it, it's working? I look for keystone species or like some of those indicator species. I've seen where hard fish, one of those key herbivores on the reef system to reduce algae, has increased in number and increased in size and species diversity. I've seen that firsthand. So from the initial survey six years ago to when I'm diving now, I've seen that transition. I've seen Nassau groupers coming back. I've seen large schools of Bermuda chubs coming back. Sea turkeys. These are the things that you look for. So I've seen those personally, not just in surveys, just going out on dives and seeing them firsthand. It's promising. It's very, very promising. So I'm excited. I wish I could fast forward it to 15 years to see what this place would look like in 15 years' time. Because if it's looking like this after only three years of, of, of intervention, imagine what it will look like in 